Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about uh, the birth narratives uh, concerning Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to look at these narratives from the perspective of tradition history. Uh, tradition history can be defined, let me get to my place where I have my definition, it can be defined as an attempt to describe the development of a specific biblical tradition over time. So it, you start with a, just the core of the tradition and then you see how it develops over time. And in the case of the birth narrative of Jesus, we're lucky because we're able to look at that tradition in two different forms, the form that we have in Matthew and the form that we have in Luke. Now, we're not limited to these two. There are uh, at least a handful of other traditions concerning Jesus' birth um, uh, that emerged from the early Christian church. The earliest one actually goes back to the Apostle Paul, whose writings are the earliest writings of the New Testament. Uh, Paul's writings predate both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. What does Paul have to say about the birth of Jesus? Well, not a whole lot. He says that uh, Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law. That's in Galatians 4.4, 4, in case you're interested. Um, so he was born of a woman. Well, duh, how else would Jesus come into being? Well, it's not an entirely uh, rhetorical question because an early uh, Christian by the name of Marcion, who lived in the second century, he, uh, some of his um, detractors anyways, uh, suggest that Marcion said that Jesus essentially descended from heaven uh, and he wasn't born at all. So, uh, but we're going to go with the, uh, the traditions that have to do with Jesus being born of a woman. And we're going to start with the Gospel of Matthew. I'm not going to read uh, the entirety of Matthew 1.18 to 2.23, but in this account, uh, I want us to focus on what Matthew emphasizes, and we're going to contrast that to the way Luke presents his account. Um, so Matthew focuses on Joseph, uh, probably to emphasize Jesus' Davidic and thus royal lineage. If Joseph is a descendant of King David, then he is part of the royal line, and therefore Jesus is also part of the royal line. And you can look at the genealogy in the first uh, 17 verses of the Gospel of Matthew, and you see that it's a genealogy that goes through David and comes all the way down to Joseph. Uh, another thing we find in the Gospel of Matthew is that um, Joseph himself is reminiscent of the Joseph in the Old Testament, his namesake in the Old Testament, who uh, received a bunch of dreams from God uh, Joseph also received dreams from God. Angels appear to him in, in dreams and uh, direct him uh, concerning what he ought to do. So in verse 18, this is really the beginning of the birth narrative in Matthew. Uh, birth, uh, in verse 18, Joseph discovers that Mary is pregnant. Um, and uh, she was found to be child uh, with child from the Holy Spirit, it says here. But Joseph didn't know necessarily that she was uh, pregnant from the Holy Spirit, at least in, in the early stages. He just finds out that she's married, and since he hasn't slept with her, he's thinking, well, the only other way people get married is somebody sleeps with them, so it must have been somebody else. And he's considering uh, divorcing her, even though they're not technically married yet, uh, they're betrothed. It's a form of, uh, you had to divorce somebody that you were betrothed to. Uh, it's a way of uh, breaking this marriage uh, contract. So he's considering this, but an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream, verse 20, and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear you a son. You are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. The name Jesus uh, in Hebrew is Yeshua. And it's related to the Hebrew word yasha, which means to save. So Jesus' name literally uh, is related to the word for Savior. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel. 
this is from Isaiah 714. This is the first of several uh, fulfillment citations in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the traditional translation of this phrase is, all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord. But that word fulfill, uh, perhaps a better translation of the Greek word, is all these things happened in order to fill the scripture with new meaning. Um, later on, when he quotes Hosea 11.1 1, that we talked about the other day, uh, out of Egypt that I call my son, well, the original statement of scripture from Hosea refers to the past. Uh, it's talking about the Exodus event, but Matthew's uh, use of it, his citation of it, fills it actually with new meaning. Uh, because now Matthew applies it to Jesus uh, and the Holy Family coming out of Egypt. So uh, there are several of these fulfillment citations throughout the, um, throughout the Gospel of Matthew, and this is the first one. Uh, so Mary uh, is pregnant from the Holy Spirit. This is a virgin birth. There are many stories of miraculous births uh, in the ancient world, and they're always associated with not surprisingly, with famous people. So people like Sargon the Great, founder of the Akkadian Empire, Perseus, Romulus, Alexander the Great, Augustus, uh, Caesar Augustus, the Buddha, and, and others all have stories of miraculous birth. Sometimes they're virgin births, sometimes not, but they're all miraculous. And um, what else do we find in Matthew's story about Jesus' birth? Um, we have... Uh, this account uh, in verse 25, it says that she, Mary, had, uh, or sorry, he, Joseph, had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. So this verse itself doesn't imply the perpetual virginity of Jesus necessarily, neither does it preclude it. Uh, this is uh, the idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Uh, develops fairly early on in Christian tradition, and it's a tradition that is upheld today by Roman Catholics, by Eastern Orthodox. Uh, most Protestants uh, do not sus subscribe to the idea of the perpetual virginity of Jesus, just that Jesus himself was a virgin birth, and then after Jesus' birth, uh, Joseph and Mary had other children in the normal way. And so this is a difference among different branches of Christianity. All right, so after Jesus is born, uh, they are living in Bethlehem. Now notice that in Matthew, that's, this is their home. They live in Bethlehem in the first place. They don't have to journey there like they do in the Gospel of Luke. And uh, they live in Bethlehem. And then these wise men from the east, literally magi, who were Zoroastrian prophets and priests, Zoroastrian priests really, these magi come from the east, and they ask, they come to Jerusalem, which is the capital city, makes sense. And they say, we have observed a star at its rising. The word star could be a star, uh, could be uh, you know, a planet, could be anything in the, in the heavens. And they were astrologers. And so they read the sign as meaning that there was going to be a king born. And so where are they going to look? But in the capital city, they ask, uh, eventually, word gets back to Herod, Herod the Great, who was king of Judah at this time, and uh, or king of Judea, I should say, the Roman province. And uh, Herod doesn't know anything about it, but he's terrified because he's the king of the Jews, and if somebody else is king of the Jews, that's a direct threat to him. And so he tells the, the wise men, the Magi, I don't know where this uh, person is going to be born, but if you find out, let me know. Um, the, the prophets, he, or he sum, summons some of the scribes, and they tell him, well, it says in the prophet Micah, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. So basically they're saying, go to the city of Bethlehem, that's the hometown of David, and it makes sense that his descendant would be born there. So the Magi go to Bethlehem, they see Jesus, they offer him immensely valuable presents, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and then they're warned in a dream not to go back to Jerusalem, and so they go, by, they go back to their home, homeland by another route. Um, 
eventually Herod figures out the Magi have double-crossed him. He decides he's going to kill all the baby boys in, in that region. And so Joseph and Mary take the baby Jesus and they flee to Egypt. And they only come back after Herod the Great has died. But because um, Herod, um, Herod's son, Archelaus, is ruling in Judea, uh, Joseph and Mary are worried that um, he will um, carry on the same policies as his father. And so instead of returning to their home in Bethlehem, they go back to Nazareth, and that's how they end up there where Jesus is raised. Um, okay, let's switch over now to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 2, and we'll see what he has to say about uh, the tradition concerning Jesus' birth. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, the focus is on Mary rather than Joseph. In fact, Luke has a genealogy later on in Luke chapter 3, and that genealogy traces uh, Jesus' lineage through, uh, apparently through Mary rather than Joseph. Um, and in the Gospel of Luke, uh, there's an emphasis, rather than on Jesus' kingship, there's an emphasis on Jesus' identity with the poor, uh, with the weak, with the humble. And this continues throughout the Gospel of, of Luke itself. In fact, even before Jesus is born, Mary sings a song after she finds out from the angel Gabriel that she is to be pregnant, or that she is to become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Uh, she sings a song that is traditionally called the Magnificat, and it's a song that celebrates the reversal of fortunes that God is bringing about. He has lifted up this lowly, humble person named Mary and exalted her above all others. And the song goes on to say that God will do the same uh, to the ordinary people, that those who are poor and lowly and uh, humble, they will be exalted, and those who are rich and powerful will be cast down. This is a theme that persists throughout the Gospel of Luke. Um, just like in Matthew, Mary uh, has a virgin birth. She is impregnated by the Holy Spirit uh, in some way. And um, another interesting thing about Luke, uh, Luke actually starts before he talks about the birth of Jesus. He talks about the birth of John the Baptist. And it's only in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus and John the Baptist are said to be related to one another. Uh, Matthew doesn't say anything about it. Uh, other, uh, other Gospels, Gospel of Mark, for example, talks about John the Baptist. Uh, so does John, the Gospel of John. Um, and none of those are Jesus and John the Baptist said to be related to one another, but they are in Luke. So after Jesus is born, well, I should say that Mary and Joseph home, Joseph's home, is in Nazareth, they only travel to Beth Bethlehem because of a census that uh, the governor, Quirinius, uh, says, says needs to be taken, and so Joseph has to travel to his ancestral village, which is Bethlehem. That's how they end up in Beth Bethlehem. And while they're there, uh, he isn't born in a home, as he apparently is in Matthew, but rather in a stable or maybe a cave in um, in Bethlehem, a place where there are animals all about. So it's a very humble, very lowly birth that Jesus undergoes. And it's not magi, wise men, who come and visit Jesus and bring their riches to him as presents. Rather, in the Gospel of Luke, it's lowly shepherds, the poor, the humble, who come to visit Jesus because the angels tell them that uh, Unto you this day is born in the city of David, Savior who is Christ the King, and the uh, shepherds go to visit Jesus. Well, after Jesus' birth, they, uh, Mary and Joseph remain in Bethlehem for 40 days to complete Mary's ritual purification. They go to present Jesus in the temple, and Jesus is praised by uh, a woman named Anna and a man named Zacharias, who are very righteous people, and they, they praise Jesus and forecast great things about him. And then after that's over with, um, they return to Nazareth. There's no mention of them going to Egypt or anything like that. They return to their homes. Now, I want you to look at the, um, the link that I have on the class website that's called a comparison of the two narratives of Jesus' birth. 
and I have two columns there. One column has Matthew on the left. The other column on the right has the Gospel of Luke. And it lays out the different parts of the, uh, of the birth tradition. And you'll notice most of it's in black. A little bit is in red. The parts that are in red are those parts that Matthew and Luke have in common. And the parts they have in common are the following. Mary becomes pregnant, though she is a virgin. That happens in both Matthew and Luke. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. That happens in both Matthew and Luke. And then uh, Mary and Joseph return with Jesus to Nazareth at a certain point, and that becomes that is their hometown, and Jesus is raised there. That's all that Matthew and Luke have in common. We, if you uh, observe traditional Christian uh, rituals and rites around Christmas time, uh, you might see nativity scenes that have, you know, an ox and a donkey. And angels and shepherds and wise men all, and gold frankincense and myrrh all mixed together well this is a blending of the two gospels but if we look at the gospels individually they tell rather different stories there certainly are some commonalities uh, that's what's in red on this uh, comparison sheet but there are all sorts of differences as well and to me the uh, differences are, are are very interesting and they are indicative of some of the emphases that the individual gospel writers, the individual evangelists, as they're called, uh, want to make in their gospel. So again, one of the things Matthew wants to emphasize is that Jesus is the uh, king of the Jews. He's the descendant of David. He's the rightful king and therefore Messiah. Whereas Luke wants to emphasize Jesus' identity with the poor and the downtrodden and the outcast. And he does so from uh, the very beginning in the way that he tells his story of Jesus' birth. So, um, without further ado, let's break into groups. Um, well, if you're watching this, we'll wait till we get to class tomorrow or whenever to break into groups. But at this point, uh, this is all I want to say now about uh, these traditions concerning Jesus' birth.